So yes, my name is Emma Schaaf. I'm a psychologist, a researcher, scientist, and recently I turned from scientific uh, research to US research. But uh, I think you should know that I was born and raised in a family of four where both of my parents were uh, developers and my brother was studying to become a developer at the time. So I was surrounded by developers and I I've seen their struggles all day long and I've seen their joy all day long when they were working on various problems. And I'm telling you this because when I talk about making developers happy, this is something that, that really is close to my heart. It really has a personal touch to me. And this is what I will talk about today. So how do we make developers happy? We are usually trying to give them the so-called happy path. The happy path is a, an experience, a user experience in which uh, they got what they need, what the expectations are. So whenever they arrive at that portal, for example, they have some tasks, some goal in their minds. And if we succeed at fulfilling their need, then we are giving them the happy path. In order to, for the path to be happy, there should be no errors, no exceptions occurring um, the, uh, on the journey. The whole experience should be just simple and seamless. But as most of the designers or all of the designers probably know, good design is invisible, which means that even if we design very carefully, that even the best user experience will be kind of, oh, okay, cool. But if you make one mistake, if there is an error, there is an exception, they get frustrated. They will be angry. So our most important job when designing for developers is actually ensuring that we are not uh, adding to their challenges, that they, we are not frustrating them. But this is not really happiness, I think. So for me, the uh, term happy part is kind of misleading as a psychologist, but I, I do understand that this is another terminology, another field. So in order to give them the happy paths, we need to understand their goals. We need to understand why they come to that portal. What are their information needs? What content do they expect to find on that portal so that we can provide them that? Um, this is something that should be mapped out for each individual website. So each website, each developer portal will have its own audience with their own needs, with their unique attitudes, unique challenges, and so on. But there is some, there are some general principles that can be applied um, when designing for them. And a good starting point is the observation of Stephen Clark from 2007, which was quite some time ago. He was working at Microsoft and he observed that there were three types of approaches to development, software development. And uh, although this was quite some time ago, recent uh, scientific articles suggest that this observation is still true, so that uh, the three types of approaches, the three approaches still exist. And I'm going to uh, share a bit about these three approaches now. The first approach that uh, we can see among developers is uh, the systematic approach. Sometimes I will refer to uh, this as systematic developers, but I want to ensure that you understand that each approach can be uh, used by any individual and uh, any developer can adapt to more uh, of these approaches depending on the circumstances, their goals, their motivations. If I had to put a quote for a systematic approach, I would say something like, I want to know what I'm doing. I want to be in control when I'm coding. So when someone adapts this style of development, then they will, generally speaking, try to educate themselves. It's like when you want to build a house from the foundations, you want to understand each step. You want to understand the rules, the suggestions, the principles that, that you can find to ensure that what you build is safe and nice and elegant and maintainable and so on. In the context of API learning, these people would uh, review the concepts and uh, architecture documentation first before starting coding. 
they would take time to pre prepare uh, the development environment and they would start from a clean piece of code and expand it systematically by forming hypotheses on what will happen uh, next if they code further. And as I've already said, they follow the proposed processes and suggestions closely. If you look at their journey, when they arrive to a developer portal, we can see that they will arrive at the beginning of their journey because they will come there to learn, to study, to understand the APIs. They want to understand the limitation, the dependencies, the architecture behind, the design, and so on. And after they feel that they are already having the knowledge to feel in control, then they will start coding. And coding is sacred for them. They really like it. They, they want to do it undistracted. So they will do everything in order to uh, be able to code uh, in a way that provides them joy. And if they have to stop coding for any reason, they will get really frustrated. You learn this if you live by developers. You don't talk to them in these terms. Um, this is, I will tell uh, why this is a very frustrating experience for them. It's understandable, actually. But when they come to the dev portal during coding, that already means that they are frustrated and they want to leave the site as quickly as possible. They just want a piece of information and they are gone. The other approach to programming development is the opportunistic approach. If I had to put a quote, I would say something like, Let's see how it can be used. It's more like when a child is playing with Lego, they will not, not study um, lengthy guidebooks about how to build something from Lego. They will put together the pieces and experiment with it. They will try out. They will check different combinations, new combinations, creative combinations, and they will learn by doing. Developers who adapt this style of uh, development approach are curious explorers. They will learn just as much as is necessary to start coding, and they want to jump into coding as soon as possible. They might have varying expertise. Uh, they could be novices, or they might not even be developers at all, but some, for example, scientists who need to code for their uh, job. But they can have, be professional programmers as well. Uh, who just don't have the motivation or the need to have a whole system understanding at this point because they're, they're writing a code just for themselves that doesn't have to be maintainable, for example. In the context of API learning, these uh, people who adapt this style will just quickly scan through the documentation and uh, start experimenting with the code examples right away. They would reuse code examples and other people's code solutions that they can find. And they do a lot of web searches. So it's not always the dev portal. They will be seeking the information. If you look at their journeys, we can see that they will spend less time initially on the dev portal than code, and then do an alternating pattern of coding and coming back for information. But this does not necessarily have to be on the dev portal itself, because as I've already said, it can be uh, on Stack Overflow, for example. They really like these kind of forms to gather information. And the third approach is the pragmatic approach, uh, which I will not talk too much about, because this is just a combination of the two that I've already mentioned. Generally speaking, uh, they will get more information uh, than the opportunistics, but less systematically than the systematic developers. They will learn what they need to uh, learn in order to start coding and feel a bit confident about it, but they will not aim at the big picture. So they will not have a, such a deep understanding as the systematic um, approaches. And um, you can see that they will have a pattern that is in between uh, the systematic and the pragmatic approach, the opportunistic approaches. Why is this important? This is important because it means that even if we take care to provide every type of content that they might need on their journeys, it might not be enough because 
it might happen that they arrive to the dev portal with a mindset in which they won't actually consume the content that we provide for them in a way that we assume that they will do. So I will give you some concrete examples. Uh, we know from research that uh, conceptual information is very helpful for developers to have. They need it actually in order to be able to uh, do the technical part. But uh, the opportunistic development style means that they will not go through the uh, guides of conceptual information. Even if you make sure to uh, put together a page that is very usable, findable, and maintained, they will not even click on it. And that is because they don't want to learn by learning. They will want to learn by doing. And this is a big difference. So if you want them to know that uh, conceptual knowledge, to learn that conceptual knowledge, then maybe you can place that information somewhere where opportunistic developers actually go. For example, code examples. You can put some very brief information about the conceptual background there, just enough for them to be able to understand the code examples and go on. The same with tutorials. You might make big efforts to create tutorials that are exhaustive. And you might think that now the novices who don't know how to get started can just go through the tutorial and, and get started. But in many cases, they just won't. And if you want that they have this information, again, maybe you can place it in places that they will actually visit. And again, code examples is a very good starting point for that because each type of um, approaches utilizes code examples. Okay, and at this point, I, I would like to go even a bit, uh, step further. And this is because when I was thinking about this topic, I felt that something is still missing. Living among developers, I did see the challenges that they faced, but I already saw that they had tremendous joy a lot of times. And what I've just explained is a bit like we are saying, we know that development is challenging, software development is challenging, so we are trying not to add to your challenges. But as a psychologist, I think that we can always do more than just ensure that someone is not too challenged. We should aim at joy. We should aim at happiness. This is a branch of psychology that is called positive psychology, actually, that deals with it. And uh, I like it a lot. And uh, I'm going to share a personal example, a personal story of why I think this is important. The story is about me getting to love statistics. And it starts in 2007 when I was, uh, I just finished the first year at the university. And uh, I had a successful exam in, at um, statistics, in statistics. And I was really relieved. And I remember having a hallway conversation with one of my professors. And I told him how relieved I was that I will never ever have to use statistics again. And I will never ever touch that software again because it really was not user friendly, trust me. And he was quite rightly skeptical about that. And five years later, I uh, became a lecturer at the same university and I was teaching uh, psychology students. Guess what? <laughs> statistics. And two years later, I was teaching advanced multivariate statistics to the students. And by this time, I not only enjoyed statistics, it became my hobby. Uh, it not only became my hobby, but I also developed a passion to teach in a way that my students understand the benefits that they can gain if they understand this field. I, I wanted to show them the magic of statistics. And this is quite a transformation, isn't it? Five years have, years have passed, but I didn't change much. Statistics didn't change much and the software was the same. So what happened? There was no single turning point. It was not a single event that changed my attitude. There were quite many ordinary working days that did actually. 
what happened is that I faced a big challenge because although I, I know, I had the knowledge that I had to learn at the university about statistics, but real data, my, my real research data that I gathered was so much more messy than the textbook examples. I didn't know what to do with them. I, I felt anxious. And because I felt that this is a big thing to do for me, I devoted quite some time uh, to, to do that. So when I knew that I had to do statistics, I would spend the whole day just to analyze data, just to play around with it, just to get an understanding of it. And sometimes on these days, the time just flew by. I forgot to eat. Sometimes I got so immersed that I didn't want to go home. <laughs> I wanted to continue doing statistics. And this experience that I'm describing is something that is called flow in positive psychology. Uh, the term is related to Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who is a Hungarian-American psychologist. And it describes uh, the, our optimal uh, performance and optimal feeling. When we are in flow, we, we are totally focused on, on a single activity that we are doing. We are totally immersed in it. The time can feel different. It, it, you can feel that the time froze or you can feel that the time flies by quickly. You can forget about your bodily needs. You forget to eat, you forget to sleep. And it really feels great. You, you feel like Superman. You're creative, you have new ideas. This is partly because your inner critic is silenced in this state. Your inner critic who says things like, well, this is too risky, it would never work. This is not how things go. You are an imposter anyways, and things like that. In this state, which is called flow, the inner critic is silent. And you can get all the ideas that, that your mind is capable of, uh, to, to give you. Um, and you. You will have all these ideas and you will do your best. The performance in a flow state can be five times as good as compared to not being in a flow state. And five times as good is a lot of improvement. And it's not only very uh, good performance, but it, as I thought, it is like being a Superman. It is, the brain is flushed with neurotransmitters that we get from drugs. And not only one type of drug, it is actually a combination of multiple drugs, but without killing you. So it's really a good experience. And it is so rewarding, so addictive, that after you found yourself in this state, you will seek to feel the same again. And this is how I get to love statistics. I found myself in this state and I wanted to be here again and again and again. And the flow for this reason is also called the source code for intrinsic motivation. This is how hobbies are developed because I'm pretty sure that we don't find hobbies. We develop them this way. So when I said I want to go a bit further, then I meant that in addition to the questions that we usually ask how to make our users happy, we should also ask uh, about this kind of happiness. So the first question to summarize my talk so far was that we should uh, consider the information needs of the developers in order to be able to provide them the happy parts. What types of information do they need? Then I went a bit further and asked what kind of mindset do they come to the dev portal with? This helps us, if you understand this, uh, this, this helps us know where to put, which kind of information, where, where, where they will actually find it. And now I would also ask the question, how to maximize the chance that developers will experience flow? Uh, this is, something that they actually experience a lot of times. Development, software development is one of the activities that invites flow because it requires deep concentration. 
And as I will uh, explain in a minute, the single characteristic of all flow experiences is actually a very focused concentration to a single activity. So no multitasking there. You have to concentrate with all your efforts in, uh, to, to the activity that you're performing at the time. Can we somehow make developers get in this state or get in this state more often? Well, the answer is uh, not. We cannot do that. We cannot do that because each of us have a unique neurobiology and each of us will uh, need different kinds of triggers, uh, circumstances, uh, psychological states in order to get in this zone. But there are some common triggers that can help anyone go there because aside from some, some serious pathologies, all of us are capable of getting into flow. And even better, this is something that can be learned. So the more you get into flow, the easier you get into the flow next time. So how do we provide the triggers that might help developers get into flow. This is not rocket science. This is brain science. To get into flow, we need them to actively concentrate to a single activity that they are doing at the time. And uh, one of the factors that can contribute to this is actually the challenge to skill ratio and this graph is from Mihai Csikszent Mihai himself from his TED talk uh, and describes the combination of the level of the challenge that we are facing and the amount of skill that we are putting into the, acti uh, the activity that we are performing. As you can see, we can have different feelings depending on uh, the combination of the challenge and the skill we are putting into the activity. Uh, the flow, the sweet, sweet spot for flow is where the challenge is quite high. So no uh, flow without struggle, unfortunately. But we already have the skills. And if we put everything into it, then we can manage the challenge. This is where flow occurs. And you can also see that there are some um, uh, zones that are quite close to flow which are the arousal zone and the control zone. And if you remember, I said that the systematic developer would want to feel in control because that is his strategy for getting into flow. This is his path or her path. And I've also said that the uh, opportunistic developer will, I, I might not have said it, but I wanted to, uh, that they like living on the edge because they do not follow the suggestions and the rules. And they would enter the flow from the arousal side. For those who are not familiar with the term arousal, it means something like excitement, neuronal activity, awakeness. So there are multiple directions from which we can uh, arrive to this state. And it will depend on the individual and on the task uh, how one can achieve to be there. There are some other triggers as well that can contribute to arriving to this state. And some of those you can see on this slide, the list is not exhaustive. So um, if we manage to focus our attention intensely, that surely helps because this is the key component of flow. In order to do that, it helps if we have really clear goals and if we have immediate feedback about our actions. So what happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? On the challenge side, you have to understand that the challenge does not have to be only about the task. So um, the same task can be more or less challenging depending on other circumstances. Imagine that you have a deadline. The challenge is instantaneously increased, right? Or imagine that you are doing a trial task and the stakes are high because you will either be hired or will be not hired. So again, with the same task, the challenge is higher. So there are some factors that can add to the challenge and in this way can help us move to flow 
from the control side. These things are consequences, risk, and novelty, rich environment, which helps us get excited. So it helps us get in the more aroused state. So how can we use this knowledge to help developers or ourselves get into flow? Well, we might ask ourselves, but how do we feel right now? How do we feel at our typical day at work, in our jobs? Where are we on this diagram? And that can help us uh, know how, how, in which direction should we go? Should we increase the challenge for ourselves? Should we increase our skills that we put into an activity? But generally speaking, if you are thinking about developers and dev portals, there may be some things that we can do for them as well. If we want them to feel more in control, if we want them to have their skills uh, improved, a good place to start could be teaching material, tutorials, guides. And these guides could be as interactive as possible because that would guarantee immediate feedback. If I do this, this happens. If I do that, that happens. These guides and tutorials could be split into manageable chunks with very clear goals uh, so that the developer who reads them would know uh, what is the end of the um, tutorial, what will be he or she able to do after reading through the tutorial. And if we want them to focus their attention, we can maybe just do a simple thing as telling them how much time it might take to go through the tutorial. And by doing this, we can give them the chance to create the opportunity to give their best attention to the task. They can decide, is this the right time to start this or not? On the challenge part, the challenge has to be high. So what do we do? Do we make the dev portal more challenging to use? No, we don't do that. But we can increase the challenge in other ways. For example, we can add some social aspect to it. We can um, make some competitions or cooperation between developers. We can inspire them to find their own challenges by providing unusual uh, case studies how APIs have been used, um, things like that. I didn't want to give you an exhaustive list of what to do because I don't have such a list. I was just thinking about this. And I'm sure that if you start to think about it, you will get much better ideas that I just had in the last few minutes. Because this is not rocket science. So why not having a brainstorming session where you think about that? How can you induce flow in your users? In a brainstorming session where your inner critic is silenced, where any ideas are welcome, you are having clear goals, you're paying attention, you know, it might be fun. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Amesha. <laughs> I think everyone is in the flow listening to your voice. <laughs> um, I don't see any questions yet. Tiffany is congratulating you. Um, what does it look like that switch? Can someone catch themselves afterwards? I mean, obviously not at that point, but can you catch yourself afterwards? Oh, that was the moment when I got into this better feeling. The flow, as the term suggests, is uh, a flowy experience. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't work like a switch, which is on or off, and it can have different depths. So you can be a little bit in flow or very deeply in flow, mm -hmm. but it will happen gradually. And uh, if you're lucky, <laughs> then you will get out of it gradually as well. If you're not that lucky and someone disrupts you, then it's very frustrating just because the feeling itself is very rewarding and getting out of it is very, very bad. Mm. At um, certain documentation pages, um, it is um, 
Typical to ask, was this helpful for you? Smiley, no, nothing. Does that break this, if it was helpful? I don't think that such a small thing would break the flow, but we should ensure not to, to give distractions to the users mm -hmm. while they are engaged in something. So I, I don't think that it would actually break the flow because when they arrive to this part, they are already finished with the task that they were doing. And when we are, when there is an already existing documentation artifact, how do we know, how can we check whether something is contributing to control or arousal uh, or it's a distraction? How do we know that? My bad news is that you will not know because the same website might be arousing for some people and helping that other people to be in control because we have different neurobiologies. So I might arrive to a site already aroused because I'm anxious, because I have a deadline, because this is falling out of my ear. Uh, and uh, in, in that case, I will need to regulate my nervous system in order to get into flow. I will have to feel more in control. I can do things like uh, breathing or uh, listening to some music if that helps me calm down. Other people will be in the control state and they might not be very motivated to do anything. So they will be like, I can do this, but I don't want to. And in this case, we need them to move to a more aroused state and mm -hmm. then they can arrive to the flow and they will do their best. Mm -hmm. But we will not know. Uh, so we, we don't have a universal recipe how to move people to a certain part of the diagram. This mm -hmm. will be very unique. Mm -hmm. What are your views on having more conceptual topics like overview topics and their impact on the flow? So if you have more conceptual documentation, uh, does that break the flow or not? How does that influence it, you think? I think that uh, the flow state does not uh, only happen when coding, uh, but it only happens when we have any clear goal in mind. So if the goal is to understand what are the APIs, what can the APIs be used for, then having very clear uh, overview conceptual documentation can help us uh, achieving our goal. And we can be in the zone if this is very well written and we feel that we, we are progressing at a good pace. Um, so I don't know if I, I answered the question, but uh, the flow will always have its own topic. It's on, um, it will be tied to a goal. Mm -hmm. And this goal can be as technical as coding itself, or it can be as uh, high level as understanding what can I do with these APIs and how can I combine them and imagining what I could do with those if I combine them in a way. Mm -hmm. but inspiring case, cases can I imagine. Mm -hmm. Is there, a, I don't know, let's, okay. Is there a way that we know um, of to bring someone from a state of frustration into a state of I am being helped here. Yes, in the state of frustration, the arousal is high and the perceived control is low. So this is where we feel frustrated and anxious because we feel that the challenge is too much for us. Mm -hmm. In order to, to move towards flow, we need to give them the sense of control. Mm -hmm. And if we give them the sense of control, then they can move towards flow. And I can give a, a personal example uh, that I had. Uh, I, uh, I tried to learn how to code, very basic stuff. And uh, I, I went to a page, which was very technical, a documentation page. It wasn't about APIs, but nevertheless, it was a documentation page. And I tried to understand it, but I was not a geek enough to understand that. But at the same time, I had some tutorials, some videos, uh, about the topic that were not really answering my question and I didn't want to bother looking at them. So I didn't watch them. And what I missed was a piece of information of how to use the more technical documentation part to understand that. And I didn't 
feel control because I didn't know what I'm missing. Mm -hmm. But if they provided me th with the information that in order to use this very technical information, you need to understand this and that object oriented programming, for example, then I would have been being helped out mm -hmm. and immediately be in control. So to move to flow. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, helping people or nudging people, uh, nudging developers towards this mind state is equally important for all three development approaches? I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, they are, I think that all developers experience flow because I, I strongly believe that this is such a challenging um, job that nobody would choose to do this if they don't, wouldn't experience flow. Flow is the reward for doing the hard job of mm -hmm. coding. Uh, and I think that all of them are actually seeking this experience, but maybe from different parts. So the systematic one would enjoy the coding process itself uh, when they already feel in control. And the opportunistic uh, development the people who adapt to this style would enjoy the learning itself because they mm -hmm. fiddle around with the code examples and they try out new things and they experiment and it's arousing, it's exciting and they sometimes find really great and innovative solutions to problems and this is where they can find their flow. So these approaches actually I think the way of optimizing the experience uh, but from different angles. Mm -hmm. Everybody can learn uh, how flow works for him or her. You can learn that. I can learn that. If you observe ourselves, when we get into the state of flow, we can retrospectively uh, find the cues that help us get there. And mm -hmm. we can reproduce that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, this was yeah, an education for all of us. Um, and as someone who really blew our mind uh, to connect these uh, sister states uh, to the flow. Thank you again. Um...